All right, hello and welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining my session. I want to share with you today um, how we can bring um, explicit and flexible payload encryption to data integration scenarios running on top of Kafka Connect. So by the end of this talk, you should exactly know how you can increase the overall security of uh, Kafka Connect pipelines for your most precious data. Let me start by uh, sharing some background and motivation why we should care about that topic in the first place. Why does it matter? So there are several studies out there which investigate different forms of security incidents and some of them are actually focusing on actual data breaches. And I was uh, not too long ago taking a look at two such reports. First, there is a Verizon's data breach investigation report and it shows us that in 61% of uh, the breaches they analyzed, credential data was involved. Now what that means is that it's not only things like security flaws or zero-day exploits which lead to data breaches. And in fact there is a second prominent number in the same report uh, which corroborates that quite nicely, namely that 80, in 85% of the cases uh, of, of data breaches they analyzed, we were involved. Well, not you or me directly, but we as the representatives of the so-called human element. Again, this can mean different things, but most often it comes down to successful social engineering techniques. Now, one mistake that companies might make is to feel uh, safe, uh, insusceptible to breaches simply because of the fact that they are running most of their uh, critical digital business in the cloud. Well, it turns out that's a fallacy. Uh, again, DPIR data shows us that um, um, compromised external cloud assets were more commonly found than uh, on-premises ones. The line you see right there, uh, some of you may recognize it. It's taken from um, a different field. It's taken from a famous pop song by uh, British singer-songwriter Jesse J. And I'm showing this to you because it's uh, in, our in our context of this talk, it's very important to memorize the exact opposite of that particular line, namely that uh, we shouldn't forget about the fact that there is a price tag uh, that comes with data breaches. And again, for me to uh, get some rough idea based on numbers, I was looking into another study. And this uh, study is done by the folks uh, from IBM. It's their cost of a data breach report. And uh, they found out that uh, the total uh, cost of a data breach they analyzed was somewhere at around 4.2 something million uh, US dollars. Now, I'm aware that this is just, first of all, an average value, an average value based on the data points that they had uh, on the based on the cases they analyzed. Uh, so it might not uh, mean a lot to us. It might also not be uh, a very representative number for, for uh, our own business activities. So there is a second number which uh, is better in the sense that it's more tangible. Uh, they try to express the cost of a data breach also by breaking it down to the per record cost of so-called personally identifiable information. And they figured out that this cost per record of this PII data is roughly at 180 US dollars. Now, obviously, um, data breaches cost real money. And this can, of course, mean different things. It's always individual. If you are very lucky, um, a data breach is barely, barely noticeable uh, for the business we do. On the other hand, it could uh, mean serious economic trouble. It could also pose an existential threat to companies that suffer from uh, such a breach. Before we uh, go uh, and switch the context over to how we can mitigate, at least to some degree, the, the risk of suffering a data breach in Kafka Connect-based uh, data integration scenarios, I want to briefly introduce myself. So my name is Hans Peter. I'm based in Graz in Austria. I'm working in my day job as a part-time technical trainer at a company called Netconomy, where we are building large e-commerce solutions for our global customer base. I'm doing that part-time, and that means I have 
some time left for other activities. And uh, on, on, on the one hand, I'm working as an independent engineer and consultant where I help uh, customers build uh, what I call modern data architectures. What that uh, means is, of course, evolving over time. But these days, I'm um, very often concerned with helping them build event-driven architectures uh, on top of Apache Kafka and combining that with NoSQL data stores such as MongoDB. Um, I'm also a community enthusiast and I try, time permitting, I try to do a little bit of open source and this is also one of the outcomes that I want to share with you uh, during this talk as well. So to reiterate that, data breaches cost money. Um, Usually we read about data breaches in the context of databases. So you might legitimately wonder how much of a risk is it really in the promised land of building event-driven applications on top of Kafka. And it turns out that Kafka-related data breaches in fact exist. Not too long ago, in December last year, um, this happened. And I, I think if I'm not mistaken, this article here was uh, the original source to bring awareness for this particular Kafka-related data breach. And I took it because it uh, is one of the better uh, articles, also one of the better headlines in the sense that it uh, allows us to immediately conclude what uh, the problem actually is. So it's neither Kafka itself nor the tool called CuffDrop, which was used together with a Kafka in, in that particular guard, uh, which are to, uh, to blame here. Um, in fact, it's human error. It's a misconfiguration. Remember what we said at the beginning, the human element is very often somehow involved in data breaches. And here, it's not about someone falling victim to uh, creative social engineering. It's simply human error. Somebody forgot to make a configuration or, or messed it up in some way. Um, and... Uh, you wouldn't believe it. They found it all. There were a multitude of different industries and Kafka brokers involved in, in that uh, reported breach here. Um, a lot of uh, you know sensitive information was leaked and was publicly exposed uh, by the brokers that, that, that stored that data in, in topics. Um, Things like um, business critical data that was exchanged by microservices, emails uh, sent through Kafka topics, uh, medical records, patient and health related information, financial uh, transactions, insurance claims, a whole uh, range of data categories which never ever should become publicly available. Now you can imagine that this caused a lot of unhappiness for the affected companies uh, and their involved people. Uh, and the, the bottom line being that, uh, Kaf uh, that a data breach, no matter if it's related to Kafka, a database or so, so some other storage system, uh, is, is problematic in the sense that there is no simple uh, undo button, there is no rollback. Uh, the moment a data breach happens, uh, the damage is done and we are working against time uh, to keep the damage as uh, low as possible. But leaving aside the, the tooling and ecosystem world a bit and, and, and taking one step back and focusing on what we usually do uh, uh, regarding Kafka in order to mitigate the risk of suffering a breach, uh, is uh, we, we try to get a certain core Kafka security mechanisms right. And uh, so in other words, what are the table stakes? What do we need to care about when it comes to core Kafka security? And it, it just boils down to essentially three different things. I'm sure many of you are familiar in one way or another, so I just briefly hop over them. First, we uh, have, of course, over the via encryption. So uh, usually when you talk to, Ka to Kafka from client applications, this is some form of uh, TLS-based encryption, Make sh making sure that uh, no one eavesdrops our data, no, no one tampers with our data as it travels across networks. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is uh, that we, of course, need some way to have authentication mechanisms in place. We want to know uh, which client application uh, the brokers are uh, talking to. So authentication, again, there's different means for Kafka uh, how, how to do authentication towards your client applications. The specifics don't really matter at that moment. You can do that. And the third thing is once we know, or at least we think we know, uh, who it is we are talking to, we have authorization checks, uh, ACLs, uh, permissions that define uh, whether or not a certain operation is allowed to be executed by a uh, previously identified client application. So things like, uh, can you read data from a particular topic? Can you write to this other topic? Uh, are you allowed to explicitly create a new topic? And things like that. 
The thing is, if we mess this up, um, in particular the last two parts, the authentication and the authorization parts, uh, chances are very high that our Kafka clusters end up here on Shodan IO. And if we just do a quick search for Kafka on Shodan IO, we uh, get a report and this uh, shows basically several thousand uh, uh, Kafka brokers across the globe which are somehow accessible over the public internet. And I don't know about you, but for me that is really disturbing, right? Now, of course, you can, can legitimately question the usefulness of these instances that are exposed here. Do they really bear valuable data or not? But in the end, for me, that doesn't matter because I think no Kafka broker, neither here on our lovely planet nor somewhere in out, of, uh, in, out in space, deserves to ever end up on that Shodan IO list. So, I think we should be clear about the fact that these core Kafka security uh, mechanisms are something that uh, is non-negotiable, at least for running production workloads, right? So no more excuses about that because core security mechanisms are an absolute necessity. But the question is, is core security mechanisms that we had um, over the via encryption authentication and authorization, is that always enough in terms of is it sufficient to have that? Or do we need some, something else in addition to that? And, and the only valid uh, answer to that question is, of course, it depends, right? But I personally claim that it's not sufficient in most of the cases uh, because there is one specific gap worth looking at. At the one end, we have network encryption, right? We had that, making sure data travels safely across the network. At the other end, we have storage encryption, various different forms. So the stuff that Kafka writes to this can be volume-based en en encryption, can be disk encryption or file encryption, different kinds of uh, ways to make sure data is stored on some device somewhere in a safe way. But what about in between? What about in between this network and storage encryption? Uh, and with in between, I mean, what about the time that our data is in actual use uh, by the brokers themselves? And the answer to that is pretty simple because brokers see everything. Um, but that's not all because so does any legitimate Kafka client. And what I mean by that is that anything or anyone with the technical means to talk to your brokers sees everything of a payloads record by default. Again, access control lists, as long as ACL policies allow you to read records from a topic, you see the record as it was originally written um, in plain text usually. So, in the end, it seems that this gap is mostly about trust. So who is it that we trust with our most sensitive data flowing through Kafka topics towards all strategic applications uh, across our, our company? Now, chances are that you, like many others, are not running or actually operating your Kafka brokers on your own, but have someone else uh, run and manage them somewhere for you. And this, again, is most of the time a good thing. At the same time, however, it means when it comes to that trust, uh, we basically build upon human promise, human promise in the form of um, policies, contracts, SLAs, and things like that, which make sure that uh, no one but us is ever accessing our sensitive data. This is not inherently a bad thing. This is how we run business. We have contracts, we have policies for de that define things. But in the end, uh, so long as there are means for uh, someone or something to access that data, legally or not, um, we simply cannot rule out misuse or fraud. Uh, and, and, and just uh, this is important to keep in mind that this human promise that we have is not the same as technical promise or technical guarantee in that sense. So with that in mind, wouldn't it be nice if we have something like end-to-end -end encryption um, for communicating parties, uh, but in Kafka context? So uh, instead of uh, thinking about users that are writing text messages to one another in an end-to-end -end encrypted way, uh, think about client applications that talk to Kafka and want to securely share sensitive data over Kafka topics so that the brokers themselves never get to see uh, the original plain text. And in fact, this end-to-end -end encryption idea is what I was carrying around with me for quite a while. 
Um, and in the end, it, um, it led to the fact that I started this uh, community project as a side project of mine, which is called Kryptonite for Kafka. And um, it's no secret that I took a lot of inspiration for, for that project uh, based on an encryption-related feature that the folks at MongoDB built into their database and drivers uh, uh, over two years ago already. So I'm trying to basically bring similar ideas to, to Kafka context and I started with Kafka Connect because it was the most obvious choice uh, for me to do so. So the community project is all about client-side field-level cryptography. That's, that's a term that we try to understand right now by breaking it down. First, client-side. With client-side, I mean anything, any client that usually talks to Kafka brokers, which themselves represent the server side. So this can be, I, I, I've, I broke it down into the different APIs that we usually use as developers to talk to Kafka, producer consumer API applications, source and sync connectors regarding Kafka Connect scenarios. And then there is stream processing applications at the bottom with Kafka streams or built with SQL abstractions like KSQL DB. And again, for this talk, we are focusing on, on the box in the middle. So we are focusing about data integration pipelines that we run with existing source and sync connectors. So we want to have some way to encrypt sensitive data on the client side. Again, all the encryption and decryption operations should only happen here at the client side, never over there where the brokers live. The brokers only ever see uh, encrypted data. Then field level. Field level uh, is uh, something where uh, we try to have the, uh, the means, ways and means to precisely define and control which part or parts of a Kafka records payload should get encrypted. So it's not an all or nothing approach. It's not just like take the whole thing, serialize it to bytes, encrypt those bytes and store those bytes. We want to control that. And here in this admittedly simple JSON snippet, we uh, could say that we want to uh, protect the social security number field here and all the other fields, we are fine to keep them as plain text fields. If we now would uh, do that uh, encryption, that field level encryption, we would end up with something that I call a partially encrypted record. And again, if any client that would try to read that uh, record from a Kafka topic could out of the box just operate on all the unencrypted fields as we are doing it usually. The encrypted fields, of course, need to be decrypted before a client can see uh, the uh, original payload again. So what does this all mean now for Kafka Connect? And uh, Kafka Connect has this nice uh, um, feature that they call single message transforms. And those of you who don't know Kafka Connect that well or don't know what single message transforms are, very briefly, this is a mechanism that allows us to make changes on a record by record basis, either before records are written to a Kafka topic or when they are read off again from a Kafka topic. And this is basically what every connector out there that exists already can use. There are several single message transforms out there which are part of uh, Apache Kafka Connect itself. Then there are some custom ones uh, that you find in the community. And you can, of course, if, if, if you want to do some transformation that is not available, you can write your own ones. And this is what uh, my project in that case does. It provides a so-called SMT, a single message transform, that does this encryption and decryption operations uh, for us uh, just by means of configuration without the need to write any code. So how can you think about this uh, CSFLC, client-side field level cryptography, in the context of source connectors? I just want to give you this uh, generic uh, scenario, an end-to-end -end Kafka Connect scenario, so that you know where it fits and, and, and where it's applied and how it roughly works, and then we're going to see that uh, in action. So it usually starts with data sources that we want to integrate with. We can be anything, databases, files, APIs, you name it. Basically anything is possible for which you have a connector available or if you don't have one available, you could of course also go and write your own connectors. But that is usually the last resort. Uh, 
this is not something that uh, companies uh, are usually doing as their core business. So you rely on existing connectors for any of such data sources. And there are plenty of them out there uh, in case you haven't uh, experienced that uh, so far. So then we have somewhere the need to deploy a Kafka Connect environment and uh, various different ways how to do that. Usually these days we deploy this uh, using containers. Some people deploy that uh, uh, Connect uh, worker nodes also as containers in Kubernetes, but you can essentially deploy it like any other uh, uh, JVM based uh, application. Then there are worker nodes forming this Kafka Connect cluster. And the idea is now that this Kafka Connect cluster, this is a separate box uh, on purpose here on that illustration because it represents the client side. We assume that this is what we have under our own full control. Whereas Kafka itself and the brokers, they are, are running somewhere else and they could be managed by uh, some, some third party or, or a fully managed cloud service or whatever it is. Then we have source connector instances, which we use, for instance, to read data from a relational database and bring it to Kafka. The first, a snapshot of the existing data, and then we could continuously stream changes from a relational database using such a source connector. For instance, Debezium is one of these projects out there that does that quite nicely using a mechanism called change data capture. The source connector does its thing, and then it uses this SMT, uh, this Cypher field SMT, and it uses it with some configuration. We tell it, well, a source record uh, that has a particular field in its payload should uh, get, have this uh, particular field encrypted. We, of course, need some uh, form of secret key for that to do the, uh, in this case, symmetric uh, encryption. And then we end up with a partially encrypted source connector record that is written into Kafka instead of the plain text record that the source connector would uh, produce without uh, uh, using the SMT. At that point, again, uh, clients which don't have access to the secret key material that was used to do the encryption would only see gibberish for the encrypted fields. Uh, at the same time, however, they could operate on all other fields that haven't been encrypted, uh, just like they usually would do. So, so this is really beneficial in the sense that, again, it's not an all or nothing approach. You can choose precisely where you want to have that extra level of protection and where you probably don't need it. So the other side then, a sync connector, again, another form of a client, talks to a Kafka topic, wants to read these uh, records that have been written into a topic by the source connector and wants to process them. And again, of course, it would read off from the topic a partially encrypted payload, in this case, again, the social security number field from the example earlier. And uh, the sync connector can only make sense of those fields that have been encrypted, again, if they use the Cypher field SMT together with the proper symmetric key that was used for the encryption. And then we can, of course, write them to any data sync that we want to. Could be, again, another database, uh, an object storage, cloud storage. Uh, we could uh, execute a webhook, uh, some API calls, whatever it is that we want to do then with that data. So with that, uh, this CSFLC idea in the context of Kafka Connect comes full circle. Uh, to summarize it again in one sentence, it's, the, it's a mechanism that allows us to precisely define which parts of a record payload we want to explicitly encrypt, and we only run encryption decryption operations on the client side, uh, which we have under our own full control. So enough talk let me switch over to a live demo scenario that i prepared and for that uh, i will just bring up in the background some um, my docker compose stack um, docker compose up and while this is coming up i'm showing you the illustration what we are going to see then in a live demo in a few moments right so it spins up the docker compose scenario there are a lot of of things involved as you will see uh, shortly here on uh, the illustration. So it's a data in database integration scenario. It, the idea is to read data from a MySQL database using, uh, in this case, uh, a source connector from Debezium for MySQL. 
it will cr do its thing, it will read from the bin log uh, or stream con con continuously stream the changes that are happening in the database for particular tables as Kafka source records. Um, and then it uses this SMT to make sure that some of these fields in the payload representing certain columns in the relational database get explicitly encrypted before they hit the Kafka brokers. Then from there, we have the sync connector side. We want to bring that data that uh, resides and is manipulated at MySQL in a MySQL database. We want to bring that into another data store. And in our case, we will use a MongoDB sync connector, for instance, to make sure that we can write uh, this data into a MongoDB um, database into as documents in so-called MongoDB collections. And again, the sync connector can only do that and see those uh, encrypted fields if it knows how to uh, configure the Cypher field SMT and if it has access to the um, key that was used uh, up here at the uh, source connector side. And then it can do its job and write the, again, uh, original data uh, in unencrypted form into a target store of our choice. Um, so that is what I'm going to show you now in the demo. Let me open that. And for that, of course, uh, I have a script prepared. It's a tiny little script, which will prevent me from making stupid typos and hopefully um, lead to less uh, uh, or, or fewer embarrassing moments in that case. So the script will basically now execute one by one what we have seen on the previous slide. So the first part is we are going to investigate the data that is currently in this RDBMS table that we want to capture. Just a very small table, a few customer records. In this case, it's just some address information for different uh, customer IDs. So this is what the database currently contains. It's enough data for the sake of this demo. Then we need to create uh, this source connector instance. And here I'm using a pretty nice CLI tool. It's called Casey Cuttle. It's written by a good friend of mine, Gunnar Morling from Red Hat. Uh, it's a very nice tool to manage Kafka connectors uh, from the CLI, essentially. And it creates a Debezium MySQL source connector in the background together with the Cypher field SMT. And I'm going to do that. And then I'm showing you the configuration. The configuration for the Debezium MySQL source connector is exactly the same as it always is when you would use it. Uh, without the SMT, and the SMT just adds a couple of lines of configuration for this connector to basically make sure that uh, we achieve our goal of having, in this case, the street data, which is in the street column here, uh, encrypted. So this is just, this is all the configuration you need uh, in order to apply this uh, explicit encryption. You run, you run uh, the cipher, you define the cipher mode to be uh, encrypt, you s specify where to find the keys. Essentially, this is here the keys are externalized to a file that is uh, uh, residing on the local file system uh, of the actual uh, container process. Um, I, I come to that a bit later, what other options we have there. And then you say which key ID, this is just an identifier, uh, this could be multiple keys that are listed there, and then you say which key should be the default symmetric key to be used for all encryption and decryption operations. And then uh, you say which part or parts of the payload, this is the field config, should get encrypted, and this is in this case the street uh, field of the JSON payload that is created by the source connector based on that data up here in the database table. And once we do that, we inspect the Kafka topic and we see that all the records are there, so not really surprising, except for the street field now. The street field now uh, contains this base64 encoded ciphertext. The data was encrypted and then it was base64 encoded so that we can, for instance, nicely use it also in the context of text-based formats such as JSON. Uh, if you would have binary data, you could think of uh, just keeping the raw encrypted bytes as well. Now, it's not supported at the moment by the SMT, but it can be e easily added. So this is how the data looks like. And this is what travels across the network and this is what brokers get to see. 
So if someone gets access to that data, no matter how, they would only, uh, on the Kafka brokers, they would only see this data as we see it here. So no way to read uh, the plain text information of the street field, essentially other than breaking somehow the crypto or of course stealing the key from the client application that used the key and, and things like that. But it's, it's, it's again, it's a different safety net if you want to, that you can bring uh, to your data integration scenarios like that. Then we, of course, can do the opposite uh, way. We can read this uh, data. We can configure a MongoDB sync connector. In that case, we apply the Cypher field SMT again. And all we do is we say we want to decrypt. Again, we need to be able to uh, have access to the secret key material. It's in uh, again coming from uh, the file system here of the container itself. And then again, we say the street field is the field that we want to have decrypted on the way out of Kafka into MongoDB. And if we do that, uh, the connector is running in the background and we then inspect the documents that have been written to the MongoDB collection, we see again that the, here are our documents uh, and the street information is the original one because it was successfully decrypted by the SMD. That basically concludes that uh, demo scenario one, which is about database integration using Kafka Connect and uh, adding this extra protection layer for your most sensitive data fields. So I'm going to shut down the containers because I will spin up uh, a second demo scenario uh, during which I want to show you a, a few more things that can be done regarding uh, configuration options and regarding probably slightly more complex payloads than this uh, simple payload that we have seen here. Essentially, usually when you capture uh, data from relational databases, they are flat most of the time in the sense that you have scalar values in your columns. Um, but that doesn't have to be uh, the case. Uh, and so the question is, what could we do if we have more complex uh, field values, things like nested fields, sub-documents, arrays, and things like that in our data. And for that, I will uh, first spin up the, the Docker Compose scenario for the demo two, and then I will again briefly show you uh, on the slide what we are going to see. I will skip the breakdown of the separate uh, images here because it's it's several things are similar and I just want to highlight uh, the differences here. So in this demo scenario, we are not talking about databases anymore. We are talking about file-based data integration. Uh, to keep things simple, we read local files. We process them with a file stream source connector. And we again want to make sure that some of the data is encrypted. The difference here now is we have some complex field types uh, that I have mentioned uh, just a few uh, moments ago. We will see how we can deal with them. And another difference is we can have multiple keys. We can uh, use, if you want to, you could use separate encryption keys for each and every field that you would want to encrypt in your payload. You could even choose different cipher algorithms if you want to. So again, here, a lot of flexibility and in, in how you want to treat your uh, encryption operations regarding your payloads. So we write it and then we uh, read it back uh, again, showing that we can deal with complex structures, multiple keys. And uh, here the scenario is such that we want to bring in the end local files to some uh, object storage. In this case, to keep things simple and local on my machine, I decided to run MinIO in a container. It's an S3 compatible object storage. You can, of course, switch that out and write directly to Amazon S3 or, or Azure Blob Storage or whatever you want to. And and in this particular case, I'm using the Camel MinIO sync connector from the Apache Camel project. So um, let me go back to the to the um, live demo here, and I think the compose scenario should be up and running by now. It's good. Again, I have a script similar to earlier, preventing me from making stupid typos and things like that. So this is now how our data looks like. I said it's not just a flat structure as we have seen it earlier in uh, our RDBMS scenario. 
We have now a field which contains nested fields uh, or a whole sub-document. We have an array field containing multiple, uh, in this case, addresses represented as, as strings. Um, and the question now is if we want to encrypt either this field, personnel, or if we want to encrypt known residences, what should happen? How do you want to treat those fields? And here you essentially have two options. You can say, I don't care, I want to encrypt the whole thing, the whole chunk, the whole uh, sub-document in this case, or the whole array. And this is the so-called object mode of the Cypher SMT uh, that uh, does, uh, does it exactly like that. And uh, we, we're going to see and inspect how the resulting data looks like if we run that now uh, in object mode. Uh, again, the configuration, uh, similar, a lot of similarities to earlier. The difference being here, first of all, we explicitly say that we want to run in object mode. This means it will treat non-scalar fields uh, as a whole. And then, and then it shows that we can have a default key identifier, which will be used for all the fields that it should process, which don't define their own key, like this. It, this key will be used for the field personnel from the payload. And then the known residences field will use a different key ID, because we don't want to use the same encryption key for that field for whatever reason, right? Um, and if we do that, the resulting data looks like this. We see that the personal field and the known residences both have been encrypted and base64 encoded. And this, the original structure that these fields had is now completely hidden away. It's opaque. You don't even know what this data was originally. You cannot tell, was this a string? Was it a sub-document? Uh, which fields it contained or anything like that? Same holds true for the original array. You don't know what it originally was. You don't know how many elements there were inside, how, what, which data type those elements had, and so on and so forth. So uh, all of that is basically hidden away. Um, and if we then, again, uh, run the sync connector side, uh, similar to earlier, so this configuration should already look pretty familiar by now. We run in decrypt mode. Uh, we, uh, again, give access to the keys. Um, and then we say, again, when you decrypt fields, uh, do that in object mode, uh, so that it knows how to treat those fields regarding the decryption operation again. If we do that, um, it writes uh, files to MinIO. MinIO, like I said, is it's, it's containerized now on my local machine. So if I go over there to my um, MinIO object uh, bucket, you, there were 100 records, which, which is why there are 100 JSON files now in, in here. And if I take any, any one of them, um, I'll make that a bit bigger so that it's easier to see. You see that it was successfully decrypted. Uh, all, so the complete structure, all the field names, the, the, the data types, uh, uh, everything is there again uh, and was successfully decrypted from this object mode encryption that we have seen at the source connector side. Now, the other mode is, and it's, it's already here uh, how it's called, it's element mode. And the element mode obviously will try to, whenever it hits a non-scalar field that it should uh, act upon, it will process each and every field individually. So it will separately encrypt all of those fields for a complex field. Uh, the only difference is the configuration that you say element here. Everything else is the same as we previously had it. And if you do it that way, uh, and we inspect the data, you see that it now looks completely different. We see the whole structure, but all the values have been individually encrypted. So we know exactly that this is a sub-document, it has these fields, but every single one of them was uh, separately encrypted. The same for the known residences array. Again, here we see, hey, for this particular uh, uh, data record, we have four known residences, but we don't know uh, the exact address information, but we know the fact that there are four. So sometimes you might have use cases where you want to preserve that level of information uh, and not just like treat uh, complex types as fully opaque and, and, and do that. So with that, um, basically the sync connector side again, then just shows that 
uh, same thing, element mode, uh, the rest is the same as we have already seen it. And then uh, I can shut it down again and I can inspect briefly the order element mode decrypted files in MinIO. Again, I take any one of them and we see uh, also in element mode the uh, decryption operations have uh, worked properly. So with that, uh, that concludes the demos I prepared. I want to let me go back to my slides one more time, uh, give you some background how this works behind the scenes, because some of you might wonder, oh, what's going on? It's a bit weird. Uh, uh, the thing is that the, all the cryptography operations uh, are done based on a cryptography library by Google called Tink. Um, it uh, uses the. Uh, it's used, of course, within within uh, the the Java code base of this SMT. There are two flavors of AES uh, encryption. The specifics don't matter, or at least they would only matter for cryptographers. And um, if you are a cryptographer, you would know it anyway. Uh, for the average user, that doesn't really matter. What matters is the fact that what they are basically doing. So one is called GCM mode, and we use it for what is generically called probabilistic encryption. And this is what you normally want to have, because it makes sure that whenever we encrypt the same piece of plain text information, we end up with a different ciphertext value. And this is, like I said, a desired property very often uh, and also makes the cryptography stronger. But sometimes you need something different. You need a way to deterministically encrypt certain pieces of data. Th think about identifiers, which you need to preserve in a deterministic way uh, to be able to correlate with other data. Think about uh, an identifier that is used as a foreign key relationship, for instance, in a database. Then. Uh, the same identifier needs to be represented with the same ciphertext, otherwise you would mess up all your relations. And this is what you use a, uh, where you use AES in SEV mode. Um, another thing that the library of Google supports, which is nice, is key rotation support. Whenever we talk about symmetric key encryption, we say that we want to uh, have the option to switch keys over time. And that's supported out of the box. The key sets, uh, talking about keys, you can manage them. You can either configure key materials directly in the config, not recommended, because you would leak the sensitive information about your secret key materials in the config. You can externalize them, which I did in the demo somehow better. Uh, but the best way is the third one, which would uh, mean to externalize your secret keys to some kind of remote or cloud uh, KMS. And currently it supports Azure Key Vault, but uh, others could be supported as well. So to sum it up, a, a few ideas. Uh, please don't see them as forward-looking statements, let alone a binding roadmap. I'm basically working on that uh, Kryptonite for Kafka project on my own in my spare time. So no guarantees that this will come, but it would be nice to have some kind of wildcard or regex matching for field names. Currently you specify them and it does an exact match of, of the config uh, value and the payload field name. Also it would be nice not to have the need to statically predefine which key identifier needs to be used for which field. Think about deriving the key identifier based on some other field in the payload. Could be useful to say data for different customer IDs uses a different key. And then additional KMS providers could be supported as well. Bigger ideas, uh, more cryptography options. One could be for, uh, format preserving encryption. And another thing, a really big one would be to make the data serialization that happens before the actual encryption to make that language and runtime agnostic. Currently it's uh, tied to Java and JVM because this is what Kafka Connect is using. So it's not a real limitation, but if we think beyond Kafka Connect, if we want to use the same ideas in other languages or runtimes, uh, this would be needed uh, before we can actually make that happen. Could be useful to have the same support for a stream processing application and have that field level encryption also in a Kafka Streams app. Let me close with the following thought. Data should continue to be a valuable asset and not become a costly liability. Um, if you like what you heard, if you are interested in that things, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I'm quite active on Twitter. Uh, it's probably also easiest to stay in touch like that uh, post-conference. And finally, you want to try that out. The 
the same two demo scenarios are, are in, in the repository listed here at the bottom and the project itself is in its own repository. Uh, feel free to check it out, try it out, uh, give some feedback, any contribution, issues, uh, anything is more than welcome and highly appreciated. With that, I want to thank you for joining. Thank you for your time. Uh, have a great rest of the conference uh, and yeah, just enjoy your time here. Thank you. Questions? Yes. It would be, of course, easier, but it would not give you uh, that uh, level of flexibility. So, you know, sometimes you don't want to hide uh, really everything because some parts of your data are not that critical. And think about if you do that, you always have the need to decrypt no matter what. You cannot do anything with the data with any client application without decrypting. And that's a, a strong limitation, which is, uh, I, I think, uh, very hard to justify for, uh, for, you know, uh, for the vast majority of cases. That's, that's the main reason why, uh, yes, you are right, it's much easier. You wouldn't, uh, also, you know, the, the code to make that work would be, I don't know, 10% or something like that. So, yeah, it, it's tricky to do that. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much for the talk and bringing this awareness and security. Uh, I'm not familiar with all the Kafka Connect things, so I wonder if it's uh, very, it seemed like it was very JSON related because the fields, the, the way you, you define, yeah. is, it, uh, is it JSON the format that Connect is work with or is it a limitation or? No, uh, in fact, uh, uh, JSON serialization is just one way that co Kafka connectors deal with uh, serializing the payloads, right? It can be binary formats such as Avro, it can be uh, protobuf, it can be different things. Um, but, but if you could use the very same name and... Yes. Name and uh, yes. You could also use it with Avro records, uh, uh, like basically, which are then binary, binary uh, serialized. Uh, it would also work with that, yes, because uh, for Kafka Connect, the way this works is Kafka Connect has its intermediary data format. Mm -hmm. It's Kafka Connect internal, and this is agnostic of the actual way that the data is eventually serialized with. And your uh, product works with that format? Yes. And, uh, yes. It works with this intermediate Kafka internal data format, which uh, can be so the only differentiation there is, is it, uh, is it without a explicit schema or is there a schema attached to the payload? But that's basically the two variants that exist internally to Kafka Connect. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest, uh, how you serialize it then uh, towards a byte stream that will be written at Kafka side is, is completely flexible. It can be, uh, usually it's, it's these four things, it's protobuf, it's Avro, it's JSON without schema or JSON with schema. That's the common ones uh, for which you also have the broadest uh, ecosystem support throughout all the APIs and tools and languages. Also, I noticed in, the, in your demos that in case where, where you define conflict for decryption, mm -hmm. you actually don't define keys. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a very good observation. So I, I probably skipped that. Uh, I wanted to mention it briefly in a side note. Uh, that's a good observation. Yes, that's true. The reason for that is that uh, the encryption works such that uh, it doesn't only take the raw value and encrypt it, it adds some, some unencrypted metadata. And the metadata contains, uh, in this case, three things a version identifier for the library itself, an identifier which algorithm is used to encrypt and de uh, hence also decrypt, and it contains the identifier for the key. This means, uh, and you are touching upon a very good point, you have, of course, uh, this adds to the overhead, right? Uh, uh, you, you have seen that probably that the strings got longer in encrypted form. That's not only because Base64 encoding basically already adds 30% uh, roughly uh, on raw data. That's one thing. But the other thing is that uh, there is this additional metadata and this could be probably optimized a bit more. Uh, so yeah, if, if, if you, for instance, uh, would choose extremely long key identifiers, this would hurt the overhead a lot because they are used verbatim as is. Uh, so they are, there's no kind of uh, 
mapping towards some numeric value or something because then again you need to map that somehow somewhere which complicates things even further. But the good part is that more or less uh, each field con is self-contained in the sense that you have all the information that you need in order to successfully decrypt, you know, uh, which uh, algorithm and which key uh, you should use uh, and, and, and that's basically it. And it helps interpretation, I believe. Yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly that. Otherwise, you would have trouble in how would you rotate, right? Because uh, in particular, when you think about Kafka, where you have data from probably a year ago in a topic that used f three keys, uh, three keys uh, that, uh, from the past, basically, uh, and, and you want to read that back, uh, you, you would uh, somehow store the information until which message you used which key and so on, and this would be terrible. So that's why uh, more or less I think that the only option is to somehow keep that contained to the, to the actual um, uh, payload field. And the last one, yeah. uh, you mentioned different options for, um, I think, key management service. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, software. exactly. No, not directly. No. Uh, so, if if your question, if you could directly interact with an HSM uh, attached to some like physical machine, uh, you can't at the moment. So, but usually, what you would do is you would uh, probably program a, against a KMIP compliant KMS that you run locally, and the the HMS modules are attached to that, and and, and you would program against the API of a KMIP enabled KMS server process that reads that off from the HSM. So I, I, I doubt that you would usually have that uh, for each and every client application, mm -hmm. honestly. But, but that, that of course, that depends on how you, how you want to work with this HSM modules. Okay. Thank yeah. you for the answers. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining and have a great day. Yeah. Ah, another one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, you, j just approach me afterwards. It's fine. We, we talk outside because there is another talk coming up, I guess, so need to leave.